Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to Game and Friday. <laughs> Except it's on Sunday, but it's really is Saturday, but But it Happy Gaming Day! There we go. We'll go with that. But you know what? In spirit, it's a game and Friday on a Sunday on my Saturday. All good. Let's get into it. Just a quick update, though, guys. Um, I had asked a question about a week ago when I was talking about the newer, lighter vibes and the improved base stations. Well, I've had it confirmed one person from at least every continent, well, except Antarctica and Africa. So anybody in Africa who wants to confirm, let me know. But probably safe to say that the new base stations and those lighter units are now shipping. Um, so at least one person from each continent telling me conclusively they've got the newer base stations. So that's good to hear. All right. A little bit of a slow news day, you guys, but that's okay. That leaves time for other things. We're going to start with uh, the first two stories, uh, one from Wired.com, the other from Upload VR. that kind of merge into each other. The Upload VR article is about the next wave of VR hardware being closer than we may think. The Wired article is titled, A Chip Revolution Will Bring Better VR Sooner Than You Think. So let's kind of talk about those for a second they got me thinking especially the wired one about computer innovation and stagnation of technology so the 80s were a time of of great creativity pc wise we had commodore atari computers apple uh coleco yes there was a coleco computer um amstrad spectrum ms 80 is the japanese one xd is that correct PC, so. PC, whatever. There was one there too. The point being, there were a hell of a lot of different PCs. Many of them based on different chip technology. For exa uh, example, the Atari ST and the Amiga, both Motorola based. While, of course, PC PCs at the time, 8286 or 8086 based, uh, etc. And your 6502s and 10s. Lots of different types. By the time the PC started to kind of gain dominance with its VGA games around the early 90s. A lot of that competition just didn't exist anymore. Yeah, there was a lot going on the console side. You had people getting excited about multimedia and CD-ROMs. But computer-wise, Commodore was at the end of its life. Uh, Atari certainly as well. Apple not as big through the 90s, or the early 90s anyways, as they had been in the 80s. It was all about Intel, 80, 286s, 386s, etc. Pentiums came, gave things a bit of a, of a new life, but they were still backwards compatible, so faster with some additional features, but always kind of hand-tied by the fact that they had that legacy past, which was an advantage, but you could also argue it was a creative weakness. PC's strength, certainly that they were modular, and that gave rise to things like 3D accelerated GPUs, the fact that PCs were so modular. And then the last 20 years, it's pretty much been status quo. Things have certainly gotten faster, graphic cards, CPUs, but in terms of new technologies, basically just improvements on the existing and throw in some more cores, and a hell of a lot more megahertz and memory. So I get what they're saying with both of these articles that VR could and likely will bring about specialization, which I think is needed. So right now we've got two types. You've got your mobile solutions, which are powered by mobile phones. You've got Certainly the ones that are Qualcomm powered, right? They've got the CPU built into the HMD. And then, of course, Rift, Vive, and Sony PlayStation VR powered by either a PC or a console. Where I think we can see some creativity and what they get into in the first article is dedicated chipsets that specialize in virtual reality strengths. And this may possibly be the first time in a couple of decades that we see some really new innovative stuff getting released over the next five to ten years. Definitely looking forward to that. 
Second article gets more into what we can expect to see out of VR hardware. We've talked about wireless, and when I do my one-year show, I'm going to talk a little bit more about wireless. We also know we're going to get a hell of a lot of Windows 10 branded HMDs later this year. There's basically going to be tons of competitor projects, and that's not even including Project Alloy and other ones waiting in the wings. Where is this all going to end? What's the natural conclusion of all this going to be? Well, I think the technology is going to continue to drive them all forward, but we're going to have technologies fall to the wayside. Hopefully, it's the stronger, better technologies that survive, but that hasn't always been the case. You could make the old Betamax VHS argument and many, many more. So if we see specialized chips, I expect that to start happening probably within three to five years, that focus on delivering virtual reality. Wireless, 60 gigahertz possibly, that seems to be the leading contender with the beam forming thrown in. Uh, or if not wireless, certainly 4K and above, regardless of whether it's wireless or not. I think that is a natural conclusion. That screen door effect will one day just be a thing of history. Confident in that as well. So just an interesting couple of articles to really sink home how crazy fast things are moving. And I'm going to touch on that more in the other video, but think about it. At the beginning, and Bumble in his video did a really good job with this, he mentioned, look, when we launched all these devices a year ago, you would mention wireless and people would say, simmer down there, Bucky, all things in their time. Uh, are you kidding? We've got this. Don't worry. Wireless will happen in the future. And then six months later, we have companies like TPCast not only saying they can deliver wireless, but deliver it with the type of low latency that we need to really pull it off. So it's going to be an interesting year and it's going to be a year that's going to really set us up for the next three to five. It's going to be really telling in that respect. Next news piece, a new Google Earth arriving April 18th. And when people ask me what kind of my top 10 or top 12 games are, I usually say games or do you want experiences in there too? The reason for that is Google Earth, I easily count among the best, most powerful things you can do in virtual reality with a Rift, with a Vive. It is absolutely amazing, especially for somebody who hasn't used virtual reality before. Most likely, everybody's got a mom or a dad or a grandparent who isn't comfortable with computers, but maybe they've seen Google Maps and Street Views, but that doesn't even come close to preparing you for the glory that is Google Earth in virtual reality. It's absolutely amazing to be able to fly around the planet, check out street views of cities on a whim, fly above the skyscrapers, and just get the kind of view that no other medium comes close to matching. Just very cool. Now, in terms of this update, uh, couple of assumptions. One, probably Daydream support. You got to figure it's their platform. They're going to support it properly and fully. But I also expect some virtual reality additions to be included. It's probably been about six months now, if I check the calendar, since Google Earth launched. Plenty of time for them to add some goodies to the, pro, uh, to the application. And the last story, guys, like I said, a little slow today. Uh, HP is going to be joining a bunch of other vendors in offering a VR PC gaming backpack style computer. But they're not just offering one, they're actually offering two models. So, of course, they're going to be joining Zotac, MSI, and Dell-owned Alienware, all of whom either have a PC gaming VR-ready backpack available or expecting to start shipping in the near future. Now, Ron Cowlin, he's the president of personal system business at HP. He indicated there were two versions of what they are calling the Omen X backpack PC. One that's going to be targeting business and commercial customers, while the other will be marketed towards gamers who don't want to have their VR headsets tied down to a normal desktop or laptop. The question I have with that is, 
typically the traditional way to kind of separate PCs for business or gaming is based on the GPU. When I make a recommendation at work, one of the first questions when they say, you know, Epics, I want to buy a PC for my family, what do you recommend? I say, does your family play games? Then I determine if it's casual or hardcore play. If it's hardcore, you don't have them walk away with an Intel integrated GPU. It's going to be AMD or NVIDIA. So found that a little strange that they would target one of the backpacks to business and commercial. What really would they be changing? Is it more robust? Because you would think GPU wise, you go to something wimpier than an AMD or an NVIDIA, it's going to hamper virtual reality. You have very strong GPU requirements. So it'll be interesting to see where those differences are. It's also going to include USB uh, type C ports, two of them, two additional 3.0 ports and one HDMI port. Personally, a system like this, if it's billing itself as a VR ready gaming backpack PC, six to eight USBs minimum. I personally don't think four cuts it, but um, that's up to them to decide. All right, guys, that is it for the news on this Saturday, Sunday, Friday. We will be back with another video shortly and, of course, VR news again tomorrow. Probably another slow day given that it's still technically part of Easter. Guys, as always, cheers.